V to G. Not a 90s boy band, but quite possibly the answer to how electric vehicles will help the grid, reduce our bills and make the grid greener. Sounds too good to be true? Well, this is the episode where we find out. That's your cue to join us in the comments. And this is The Fully Charged Show. Like The Fully Charged Show? Then you will love our six live shows being held around the world in 2023, starting with Sydney, Australia on March the 11th and 12th. Vehicle to Grid is pretty much what it says on the tin, sending electrons from your EV battery back into the grid. But why is that in any way valuable? After all, siphoning off petrol, perhaps the internal combustion engine equivalent, is literally only valuable to the people taking that petrol away. Well, 1 million EVs with V2G could be the equivalent of over 5,000 wind turbines. And given that by 2050, we're expected to have 37.4 million EVs on the road in the UK, and suddenly, V2G could be a bit of a lifeline. But that doesn't necessarily paint the full picture. Renewable energy is cheap and clean, but it's not continuous. It fluctuates depending on the sun and the wind. So when supply can't meet demand, that's when fossil fuels step in to plug the gap. And right now, they step in a lot. But we don't always use the same amount of electricity. We have peaks of usage, generally from 7am to 9am-ish, and again at 4.30pm to 7.30pm. And in those instances, that's when fossil fuels really, really have to plug the gap. So two things are happening. The wholesale price of electricity fluctuates throughout the day, i.e. when demand is high, prices are high. When demand is low, prices are lower. And two, when demand is high, the grid is generally dirtier. And here's where EVs with V2G can start to make a difference. Imagine if we can siphon off some of that renewable energy when the demand on the grid is lower, store it in the electric vehicle batteries and give it back to the grid when demand is high, that has three massive benefits. It reduces the overall demand on the grid at that peak. During that peak, demand can be met by a higher proportion of clean energy. And three, and arguably the most tangible benefit for a lot of us, households will have benefited from buying energy when the cost is low and selling it back to the grid when prices are high saving enormous amounts on our energy bills. And actually a fourth benefit, energy bills in theory would come down for all households, not just EV households, as peak electricity demand that today sends wholesale prices rocketing will have been brought down thanks to the contribution from the EV batteries. And put in those terms and suddenly V2G is like being some benevolent Wolf of Wall Street meets Roblox player with a pump storage facility parked outside your house. And of course, in the future, the grid will be bigger to support greater electricity use and much more of the grid will be met by renewables. Maybe 70 to 90% by 2050, depending on what state of policies are met by then. And in that instance, the benefits of smoothing out those peaks in demand by using V2G become even more acute. And we're already kind of used to some of these principles. Time of use tariffs, for example, encourage shifting usage of electricity away from times of peak demand by making electricity cheaper during periods of low demand, such as overnight. And smart charging operates on a similar principle. Companies like Octopus go one step further with flexible tariffs that update prices every 30 minutes based on up-to-date grid demand and also have plunge pricing where customers are paid to use electricity when there is an excess of green energy. And customers are recording hundreds of pounds of savings that way. And as well as flexible tariffs, Octopus have been running saving sessions where they've asked customers to reduce energy consumption at peak times and shift it a little bit later or earlier. And on November the 15th, between 5 and 6 p.m., 200,000 customers reduced their consumption by 59%, offering 108 megawatts of grid flexibility. And clearly, reducing consumption is the easiest route to reducing the size of the peak. But V2G could take us even further. And to explain the who's who of V2G, I'm going to call upon my glamorous assistant. Now, there are a couple of flavors of V to G. In the most basic camp, there's V to L or vehicle to load, where AC power is taken from the car to power appliances or charge another EV. BYD, Hyundai and Kia have been quick off the mark here, with the Hyundai Ioniq 5 recently powering a luxury cabin in Essex. Vehicle to home or V to H takes us up a notch. Here, energy from the car can be used to power a home or business. In the US, where a slightly weary grid can result in power outages, this has proved a key selling point for the Ford F-150 Lightning. 
but V to H could also work for cars in car parks to power buildings like hospitals or businesses. And then comes full-blown V to G, vehicle to grid. The Dutch city of Utrecht, with the help of a company called We Drive Solar, is probably the most advanced here and now has 800 bi-directional chargers on the streets. But there aren't yet many cars with V to G capability. Utrecht originally used modified Renault Zoe's and Hyundai is currently modifying 25 Ionic 5s. And in fact, the good old trusty Nissan Leaf, the Nissan electric van and the Nissan Aria are the only fully electric vehicles that are V to G capable. And yes, there may or may not be a Mitsubishi PHEV with V to G. Now, both Octopus Energy and Ovo Energy recruited Nissan Leaf drivers for their recent V to G trials, and GM and VW will soon be joining the V to G gang. American school buses have also been of significant interest. With reasonably limited use, big batteries, and a lot of time parked up, they are prime V to G candidates. And lastly, V to X, or vehicle to anything. These V2G trials are, however, still very much in their infancy. Porsche ran its trial with just five takeans, And it's not so much from a technical point of view, but more because it's a blurring of worlds. It's the first time that energy companies, EV companies, policymakers, charging people, and all the technical AI modeling wizards need to come together and figure out how they're going to make this V2G puzzle work. And for this, I need to speak to an expert. Mike Schooling is the CEO at Indra, a company making V2G bidirectional chargers who have also been involved in a VHG trial with Ovo Energy and Calusa. Mike, tell us about the trial that you recently did with Ovo and Calusa, and what were some of the outcomes of that trial? Sure. So we we set up the project to prove VHG at domestic level. So we, we'd never proven that before at uh, single phase and wall mounted or anything like that. So so our part of that trial was to uh, generate new hardware and to to create the, the software ecosystem to enable us to, to run that in the future. Um, so we got. About 430 people, um, domestic customers, over energy customers throughout the UK with Nissan Leafs, set up onto the, the trial and ran over two years now. Um, and we've still got a lot of those still on the, the trial, still running, even though the two years are up, proven value for the grid. And essentially how that was working is you plug the car in when you get home, um, the car would charge up overnight, um, and it would discharge whenever there's an evening peak or a peak within the day. So how were customers actually rewarded for giving back energy to the grid? So, so for that particular trial, it was all done through their tariff. So what we would do is they have a fixed import tariff. So they would pay um, whatever they would normally pay for their electricity. Um, we would then charge their car at that same rate. And then they would get a high rate of export. So um, typically it was 15p above the import rates um, for someone with that solar. Someone with solar, I think it was 12p above. So they start to, you know, actually kind of feel the benefits in their pocket quite quickly then. Yes, absolutely. So um, we've got many participants in that trial who were basically net zero on their bills. So um, by the time the, the export credits have been applied, they were more or less at zero. Some people made money, you know, especially with people with large solar arrays. Some people, you know, it's less lesser impact because the, the cars aren't maybe present for as long or, or something like that. I know you're also looking at vehicle to home as well. And if people do have a solar array and they can start to optimise that ecosystem for themselves, does that become slightly more appealing than, say, vehicle to grid? And this is the contentious bit. A lot of EV drivers have solar panels at home, and a big chunk have a home battery as well. Suddenly, between owning an EV, a few kilowatt hours of storage, and a big solar array, there's possibly a greater incentive to balance your own self-generated energy in your own home than give it back to the grid. I think it depends who's controlling it, who's you know, kind of funded the asset. So the way I look at this is for a, an individual, um, you probably want to optimise behind the meter before you offer any of the services. So that means that I'm going to divert any excess solar into my car's battery. And then when there is a peak within the house, um, not on the grid, just within the house, so maybe I'm cooking, maybe the hot water tank skips over, um, that I actually discharge back from the car's battery just to support house loads, to keep the house at zero. What that means, I can then um, utilise my renewables to, to run the house. But I can also... Um, run the house from off-peak electricity overnight. So um, yeah, perhaps in the winter, we're no solar generation. We're we're charging up overnight as well as topping up during the day. The, the benefits are really clear, but clearly there are sort of technological and logistical challenges along the way. Tell me about what some of those are. 
So it's a really complex value chain at the moment, and the legislation hasn't caught up yet. Um, and this is one of the reasons we think vehicles home will be the next set rather than vehicles grid. Um, got to get all these people aligned. And to give you an idea, it's the homeowner, the vehicle owner, um, the charge point manufacturer, the vehicle manufacturer. Then you've got um, yeah, the DNA who provide cable into your house. Um, you've got uh, the transmission network operator. So National Grid have got to put legislation in place. Um, as well as the energy companies and the the aggregators of virtual power plants to bring all this together and ultimately vehicle to grid everyone wants a little bit of a slice of that um so the, the value you know is less for the end consumer at the moment under the current models but in the future we can see those markets changing with, with legislation and things moving so even though it's still really really complex having vehicle to grid within a domestic setting is presumably a little bit easier than vehicle to grid in the public sphere how challenging will that be for, you know, installing vehicle to grid in a public charger? So what we've got to look at is where do cars charge overnight? And it's all around dwell time. And this is the same for standard domestic chargers that are unidirectional. So you look at where the car's going to be charged and that's where you put the infrastructure. So um, typically that's going to be on someone's driveway overnight, but we recognize you hear the stat that 60% of homes have got a driveway, 40% don't. Um, of those 40%, we think roughly half of those don't have a car. So 20% of the market doesn't have a driveway that has a car. Um, that's then going to be charging in other places that could be on street it could be a supermarket it could be a workplace um could be gym health club whatever else that might be um or it could be a charge hub like a, a um, on the motorway services so um not all of those use cases will work with vehicle to grid yeah and certainly if you're stopping at motorway services you don't want to be discharging the car but maybe if you're charging on street overnight or a hotel or whatever else there is a, a place for b2g still so a big question is that does the bi-directional charger exist within the vehicle or within the charger itself. Which direction are you seeing that go in? Now, there is a second contentious bit. A household runs on AC, alternating current. And in your car, you have an inverter that turns that AC into DC. And that works one way. So to get electricity from your car into the grid, you either have to have a bi-directional inverter in the EV. Now, car companies might not love that because it adds expense to manufacturing the car. Or that inverter is contained within the DC charger on the wall. And that's annoying for the charging companies. Um, we think both will be part of the future answer. So the reason we think that is with DC chargers, it's um, power electronics is a box on the wall. And that means cost, complexity, weight out of a vehicle. There's a big advantage for that. And generally, that's where vehicle manufacturers want to go. Where that's in a fixed location, like on someone's wall of their house with a fixed driveway, that makes a lot of sense. But there's other locations, for example, if you're charging off a lamppost where you just can't fit that infrastructure. So therefore, AC V2G, where that power conversion takes place on the on the vehicle itself, with the additional cost weight complexity, and maybe that's an option in the future when you buy a car, um, that's probably where that'll go. So, And that'll be different for different markets, different use cases, um, and everything else there. So I think it's a real mix we'll see in the future. So if there was one thing that could make your life easier towards, you know, making vehicle to grid at scale that much easier and that much quicker, what would that be? I think standards adoption is where it's coming next. Um, so we started off with, with Chadamo based vehicles with Nissan Leaf. And um, that's been in standards since 2013. And actually any Leaf um, in the UK that's on the roads already already supports that um, without any, you know, deed of visit or anything else to, to uplift it. With... Um, the newer standards coming on with CCS coming on board, the standards are just starting to emerge and settle now. So that, that's going to have to be a catch up a little bit. Um, and that means that if you buy a CCS vehicle today, chances are it won't support bi-directional charging out of the box. And it'll probably need a dealer visit or an over-the-air update in the future. Um, the other part of this is I think we just need a, probably another round of innovation trials and funding just to really mature the market a little bit more before this becomes mass market. So as the protocols and mechanics of how this will work become clearer, I'm sure we'll see a whole lot more B2X and B2G. And I hope so, because it's the first time that we can make the grid really, really tangible and something that we can all help shape and control, from how much we use, where it comes from, how much we pay for it, all whilst alleviating the pressure on the grid. That said, I'm curious to know whether vehicle-to-grid enabled EVs will make us push for solar so that we can all optimise our own individual microcosms via vehicle-to-home, or whether we'll become ruthless day traders trying to minimise our energy bills whilst reducing the pressure on the grid. Either outcome is good as long as it doesn't exclude any households from being able to afford to participate in this EV grid gaming. Let us know what you think in the comments and like and subscribe, and if you have been, thanks for watching. <laughs>